Abbott, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God, we've been waiting on you. Hey, we're ready to get back into this 78th Psalm to see what our Father has for us. We just thank Him for blessing this great nation, America, for our neighbors, everywhere, for you out in the islands, and uh, just praise God for you. And we ask a word of wisdom from Him in Jesus' precious name. We continue in this 78th Psalm. Let me, if I may, lay just a little bit of foundation, for this is a psalm of uh, Mashkir, which in the Hebrew tongue means instruction. There's instruction in this for you, to by of, of Aesop, which is the one that gathers the congregation. What congregation? God's congregation. He said in verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. What, is, what the, the full in-depth meaning in the Hebrew is this. I will show how divine history says a great deal more or contains more than appears on the surface. So you've got to dig a little bit. He forewarns you. Speaking in Proverbs for all and parables for not everyone is supposed to know or understand. And his whole point was this. Is look at the events that happened in the past and learn by them so you don't have to suffer the same thing all over again. He went, if you would, to the point of the delivery out of Egypt, the redemption from Egypt, how that he had given them a light at night and a cloud by day to guide them, to direct them, had given them water, had given them quail, and had given them manna, which is to say bread from above. And you'll remember we went to St. John chapter 6, 31, where Jesus said, Yes, it was not Moses that gave you the bread, but my Father which is in heaven. And I am that bread. Now, what does it mean? It means that even today, if you look for that more that is said, more than what would appear on the surface, that Christ is telling you even today when you're in trouble, that that manna, which Christ is now the new bread, falls daily if you will only partake. If you'll just reach out and say, help me. You have that same manna supplied today, that same miracle performed by Almighty God for anybody that needs a helping hand. If uh, you believe upon Him. It's that simple, friend. People try to make God's Word so difficult, and it flows like honey over the buds of your mind if you'll just open those ears up and understand the lessons that your Father teaches, yes, even through these Psalms, which are ever so prophetic, and yet our people continue. If they can't see it, like, remember he used the example in the last lecture, he opened the Red Sea, they could see the footsteps, the footprints on the dry sand, but as soon as the water closed over, the footprints were gone, nobody wanted to believe they'd crossed the Red Sea. And it would appear, in as much as he let the meat from the quail fall right in their lap, and they would still scoff while the meat was still in their mouth. But seeing is not always even believing with that. You have to believe on your Father. Trust Him. Love Him. These same miracles are present today. And as much as that bread falls daily, that meat from God's Word, if you'll only open your mind to it. But they continued to turn away from Him. His wondrous works. Let's pick it up. Psalm 78, verse 34. Let's go with it. Those that had um, mocked in the wilderness, those that would not accept his wondrous miracles and truths, uh, is who this address is, 34. When he slew them, hey, God doesn't mess around, friend. When he slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and inquired earlier after God. Sometimes it comes to this. You know, you, some people will not think of our Father through their entire days unless they're in trouble. 
And boy, you give them just a little bit of confrontation and they go whimpering like a puppy. And help me, Father, I promise you I vow this, I vow that. If you'll only get me out of it this time, Lord, I'll serve you forever. They find him in a hurry then. But you see, don't ever forget, learn the lesson. God will strike you down. Don't always blame it on Satan. Your father wants your love. Are you going to give it to him or not? Because if you get out of his will, and even in ignorance, end up mocking him, he'll knock you down. One way or the other. Why is it that sometimes people must go all the way into the gutter before they learn a lesson, before they reach up for a helping hand? That's what this chapter is, this psalm is about, is learn from the mistakes of our ancestors. You don't have to commit them all yourself. Verse 35, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God, their Redeemer. He is the only Redeemer. He is the Redeemer that saves you from trouble. You don't have to get in all that much trouble before he will reach down and help you out. It's real, friend. We're not playing church. Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. It's a living experience. You know, what does it mean, he's our rock? Let's not just read over that. If you want to go out here and stand on the slippery, slimy foothold that Satan gives you in life, friend, you have at it. You're never, you're uneasy. You're not sure of yourself. You don't think you've got things figured out. You're shaky on all points. You don't understand what people are talking about when they talk about the Middle East, etc., etc. Your Father instructs you in His Word. All you have to do is step up on that rock, that solid foundation, and be a man or a woman or a child of God with some strength and fortitude where you can speak out boldly, Thus saith the Lord. And people will respect you then. But if you, if you want to wallow around on those slippery slimy uh, sinkholes that Satan will let you stand in, but have at it. If you want to stand in the mire, have at it. Build your house on it, but build your house on the rock and have peace of mind, stability. He's your redeemer. Hey, it's pretty hard to redeem you if you won't stay on a solid foundation. Do you understand? Verse 36, Nevertheless, son, uh, they did flatter him with their mouth. Oh, giddy, giddy. Oh, God, God, God. Well, they say it with their mouth. But it's not a reality to them. And they lied unto him with their tongues. They made false promises. Again, Lord, get me out of this sex and I'll do anything. They don't mean that. They just won't help. So, let your mind drift back to a lecture or so hence where... You had a psalm that the old boy starts outside of the sanctuary. I talked to myself. I did this. I did that. I could not understand. I, me, mine. All within self. God is your counselor. And remember the Selah came along. Pause, meditate. And when he begin to say, Thou art my Father. Thy shall redeem me. Thy shall deliver me. Thy, uh, thou art my counselor. And begin to listen to the Father rather than getting all poor me, baby, I'm all in trouble business and look outside of their own little pea brain and begin to absorb our Heavenly Father's word and counsel. Then he saw light. You know, if there's any one person that's in trouble more than anyone else, it's what I call a poor me baby. So oh, poor me. The whole world picks on me. That's the height of ignorance. Verse 37, for their heart was not right with him. Their the heart better translates from the Hebrew mind. Their mind was not right with him. You know why? They didn't know his word. Neither were they steadfast. That means loyal in the Hebrew. I would rather it was translated loyal in his covenant. They would covenant with anything, just like one of these old bird dogs that will hunt with anybody that will hunt with them. 38. But he, being full of compassion, our Father, beloved, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. They deserved it, but he destroyed them not. Yea, many a time 
turned he his anger away over and over and over and did not stir up all his wrath. Beloved, you better listen to me and you better listen good. All of it is still there. And it's going to be turned loose someday. Where are you going to be standing, friend? In his love or his anger? The choice is yours. 39. For he remembered that they were but flesh. He knew they were only mortal men. A wind that passeth away and cometh not again. He knew that in that flesh, once it went into the soil, it would never raise again. The soul, the spiritual body, yes, instantly. But flesh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, never to be. Flesh is sin, and when you're in it, God has compassion and understanding. He created the very body in which your soul inhibits, inhabits. He placed your soul therein. He is your father. How, you know how forgiving he is. You see, his whole point is, is throughout history, it's happened over and over. He said, I hope my elect will learn from this. You that understand the parables, you got it. You that have eyes to see and ears to hear. But you won't have to go through this as others. 40. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Back to the history. How often they rebelled. Complaining, I'm telling you. They absolutely, literally saw the sea open, saw the quail fall, saw the water come from the rock, and still built a golden calf. All for an example to you. Learn from it. Don't be one of those. Let the bread of Christ fall into your life, and let the real manna be sown in your life daily. It's a miracle from God if you'll only stand on that rock and partake of it. 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They doubted Him. Yeah, it's true. Some people could go a generation or two back from the crossing of the Red Sea. Well, I wonder if it happened or was it a fairy tale? I wonder if Noah really saved the domestic animals of the earth. I wonder if that actually happened. You like to live recklessly and tempt God when you allow those thoughts with the proofs and reproofs uh, that are written. Well, just tell me as a human being how I can decide if God's word is true or not. My friend, in, in studying Psalms 22, which we covered many, many lectures back, Christ's actual words on the cross with the nails through his hand and his feet and the Romans get gambling for his clothing at his feet, even the evil enemy of a high priest stating and spewing the very words written in the psalm hundreds of years later, if that won't convince you, friend, you got trouble. you stubborn. You are indeed an agnostic. But you won't be always. You see, you may be a lost agnostic, but you're not going to be an agnostic always because you're going to know there's a God. Because he's going to show you. 43. How he that wrought his signs in Egypt. He put them there. Well, I guess I skipped 42. I'm sorry. I'm going to back up and get it. 42. They remembered not his hand, that hand that guided them, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. They forget those things, those marvelous deeds. Now 43. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. Again, Zoan being that starting point of the delivery, the redemption, that start of the march. What he's saying, he showed them sign after sign with Moses holding the staff and turning to a serpent, etc., the water being changed, the frogs. Uh, well, let's read of it. 44. And had turned their rivers into blood and their floods uh, that they could not drink. 45. He sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. All those signs. Not signs that just happened because there had been a heavy rain, we've got a lot of frogs, but Moses the prophet predicted it before the event. That's what a prophet is. is someone that warns before the fact. 
and let it be God speaking through them so that it be a true prophet instead of some of these false things we've got running around the country today. 46. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar, that's the locust, and their labor into the locust, a different stage of the locust. 47. He destroyed their vines with hail, and their sycamore trees with frost, better translated hail, ice. 48. He gave up their cattle also to the hail. Have you ever seen hail the size of softballs? It's just like polax in a steer. And their flocks to hot thunderbolts. Have you ever seen a group of animals huddling together to avoid the storm? And that thunderbolt, which is to say a lightning bolt, hit a herd like that and killed the entire flock? Your father is able, friend. 49. He cast upon them the furiousness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels. Did you hear me? Evil angels among them. You think it's not possible? Why do you think when sometimes when your family is just at each other's throat? You're both good people. The little children standing off observing and hearing all this. And you're, you're fighting at, a, at, a, at an age usually younger than the children are. What do you think causes that? Do you think it's an accident? Old Slewfoot Satan is standing right in that same room with you or one of his little people laughing his head off because he has two Christians fighting like animals or arguing like animals. He's got you going his way. You need to mature in Christianity. And when one of those negative thoughts come along, realize who's trying to, to make it prevail. You think it doesn't still happen? Turn with me over to First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. You hold your place there in the Psalms. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 reads, Concerning evil angels. That's demonic also, beloved. Chapter 4, verse 1 of First Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressedly. It's going to speak very plain and very clear. That in the latter times. You understand where the latter times are? That's now, friend. Now, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. They're going to lose it. Giving heed because they listen to seducing spirits. That's evil angels, friend. They're coming. Michael's going to throw a whole truckload of them out with Satan. 7,000 of them to be exact. You understand? 7,000 evil angels. And doctrines of devils. And people are going to listen. You understand? People will listen to it. It's going to happen. The evil spirits are already among you when you listen to them. Next time you have a family argument, both of you just stop and tell each other you love each other. And take the oil of our people, the olive oil, anoint your house and tell Satan to get out of your home. You don't have room for him and begin to partake of some of that bread that is the body of Christ that falls daily. Enjoy yourselves. Let's continue on with this in First Timothy. Just speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That means having their conscience so, so accustomed to arguing and things going wrong that it becomes everyday normal, the norm. Forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meat, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I want you to know, know the truth. There's a lot of ministers that would tell you, well, it says right there that all meats created by God are blessed now, and the health laws are gone. It didn't say that at all. It shows you the ignorance from the pulpits of this nation. It states very clearly, which God has created to be received. He didn't create vacuum cleaners to be received. By that, I mean he did not create the scavenger as food. He didn't create it to be received. He said, don't receive it. All of that that he created to be received is blessed, and you can partake of it. It's clean. And he said, eat it. Don't ever let any man tell you not to eat meat. Do it. 
wisely leave the fat alone. You're going to have a lecture on that soon by Dr. Alexander, but well, well, I'm going to digress totally away from my subject if I'm not careful here, but I'm telling you, learn from the past and know and understand that there are seducing spirits and that God will send them. If you don't know any better, friend, given the bread of life, which is to say the words of Christ and the power to say, get behind me, Satan. You demons go back where you came from. Let's see if it doesn't improve your life. You try it once, but be sure you do it in his name. You use your own name, and that demon's liable to say to you, as he said to some of those before Paul, Hey, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who in the world are you? You better know what you're doing, is what I'm saying. So, protect yourself. Learn. From the past experiences, let's return to Psalm 78, verse 50. Let's go with it. He made a way to his he made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death. He let his wrath go, friend. He got mad, but gave their life over to the pestilence. It happened. Don't let it happen to you. 51, and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength, and the tabernacles of Ham, which is simply another term for Egypt, geographically speaking. Do you understand that? God killed a bunch of little babies. God killed a bunch of the firstborn, regardless of what they age, or age what their age was, of both men and cattle. Because they wouldn't listen to him. You better listen to him. This is his word. You know, sometimes when people first tune me in, I anger them. But be angry with me, if you will, for a little bit. But uh, but be patient with me to hear your father's words. All right? <clears throat> Don't worry, you'll be back. 52. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He's a shepherd if you're letting be. 53. And he led them on faithfully so that they feared not. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. God protects you. That's what he's saying. You can be in the storm and God will still protect you. 54. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to his mountain, that Mount Zion, which his right hand had purchased. That's where, who's at his right hand now? Jesus Christ is. Ezekiel uh, 16 shows you the marriage feast that Almighty God made with this mountain, Mount Zion, Yahushalem. 55. He cast out the heathen, that's to say the nation, also before them, and divided them an inheritance by line or by lot. That's where the term our city lots come from today. And made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents and their own Tabernacles. So this, of course, speaks of Joshua and that entering. He drove out. You know, they were afraid to enter the promised land because of the giant. Hey, there was one, only one old snaggletooth giant left. God had already killed the giants out. The Canaan, Canaanites had even killed part of them, along with other peoples. There weren't any giants left there. God had already taken care of it. They were afraid for nothing. They were afraid because they did not listen to God. 56. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies. They wouldn't do it. Do you today? Or do you even know what they are? Then don't be ashamed if you don't. Just start now studying and learning what your Father is saying to you. 57. But turn back and, and uh, dealt them faithfully with their fa- like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. Again, deceit, de- uh, disappointing their father. Do you understand what this has reference to? <clears throat> Your father wants to shoot arrows of truth. And when he loads you into that bow and pulls it back, he likes an arrow that can cut it, friend. By that I mean get the job done. Not one of these arrows that will start on a straight course and the first time some little demonic or evil thought or some temptation shows up, the arrow curves off course and is useless. 
If God sends you on a mission, do it. 58. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. They wouldn't worship God, but they would worship in images. Now, for those that might read too much into what I just said, let me give you a warning. Some feel that God speaks to them when God doesn't speak because they listen to false spirits. Let me give you an account of how you can always know whether a mission is from God or not. If you think God intends for you to do a thing, it will be written in his word. If you can't find it in his word, you better get your act together because you've been listening to some spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. 59. When God heard this, he was wroth. He's angry and greatly abhorred Israel. He hated them. 60. So that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. That means rest. He wasn't going to give them any rest. He wasn't going to give them any peace of mind. The tent which he placed among them. This has to do with the Ark of the Covenant, beloved. 61. He delivered his strength, which is his Ark into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He let him take it. That ark that was the personification of the law and his covenant, and even the manna that was in that ark as well, that was from heaven, that bread which is in Christ today that falls all around you. And yet you start to death, beloved, start partaking of that manna, the bread of life, and never hunger. 62, he gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. Because of this, he was angry with them. 63, the fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given to marriage. What it, what it implies in the Hebrew, and part of it is left out, is that there are so many of the young men killed in battle because they're losing battles that there is no one for the young women, the maidens, to marry back home whereby you hear the wedding song. Much of that is left out. It's all in the Hebrew. There's another wedding coming. Make sure you attend the right wedding. 64. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. They didn't dare. 65, then the Lord awaits as one out of sleep and like a mighty man, a hero that shouted by reason of wine. 66, and he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. Do you know what happens when you smite your enemy in the hinder parts? It would look a great deal like Jesus when he booted uh, the enemy out of the temple. It helps to wear a big shoe, in other words. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Do you know how long that is? That's always as long as there's an enemy. But they're not going to be an enemy forever. 67. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph, didn't want it, and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. 68. But chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount. Zion, that's Jerusalem, which he loved. 69, and he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which he had established forever. He had founded forever. 70, he chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. Oh, remember how David's father caught and first out his big, healthy warrior sons, and the angel of God said, I don't want them. you still got another son somewhere. And he picked that little old shepherd boy out of the hills. He picks whom he chooses, beloved. Has he chosen you? Do you have a destiny? Have you known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you were being taught? And you knew there was a purpose in life for you? Has God chosen you? Do you have ears to hear? Then he has. 71. From following the youth, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. And so he did. Not long after this, he slew Goliath, the giant, when the entire armies of Israel refused to attack. That little shepherd boy slew the giant. 
72. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. Do you know what the moral of this is? If we were to give it one, and we will. Don't doubt God. Don't doubt him. He said, if you want to go through life with failure after failure after failure, have at it, friend. But the bread, the manna, the ever-present feeding of God, the true shepherd, never leaves his sheep. Well, I haven't seen him. That's because you're blind. Open your eyes. The manna falls, the truth and the strength, the power that lets you stand on the rock. But if you doubt our Father, you lose it all, for in his void, no... And you're a, you're a lost soul. But it's simply there for the believing. Don't, don't be so stubborn that you have to learn from, from your own mistakes. Learn from other people's mistakes. And grow strong in the Father. For if you are strong in the Father, then when he loads his bow, and you become his arrow, you won't disappoint him. He doesn't want, the de- uh, he does not wish to have a deceitful bow. He wants one that he can count on, thing that you serve him. Let him know today that you love him. Won't you do that? Let your heart listen a moment, won't you please? Study by tape. Donation $4 per tape to the Shepherd's Chapel. The three world ages, are you familiar with it? You need be. You've got to take the blinders off your eyes concerning this world age, the world that was and the one that's coming, hey, it's written in your Father's Word. Are you skilled in His Word? This will help you in that uh, study. Dreams and visions, what actually are they? How do they apply? Can you translate? Do you listen to someone that God speaks through in dreams? Can you tell the true dream from the false? This tape will help you, for it discusses what God has stated. Stones of destiny, this, his cup shall not pass, or this cup shall not pass. A study of the stones that trace our ancestries to a point, and another cup that will not pass, that cup that Jesus prayed about. Do you know which cup it was? It's not the one most think. Song of Moses, a song according to Revelation 15 that all Christians must know, must know by heart must know that song that they will be singing that overcome. For you see, within the song are the very acts that God's elect will be doing in that final generation. Uh, Acrostics of 11. This is the work done. Uh, there is no other that I know of in existence. Um, it shows you how biblical numerics are used in God's word, how he hides messages for his elect, messages that strengthen you and give you a closer walk by him by knowing your father said that to you. Christmas, was Christ actually born on this day? No, you will find documented evidence from the word of God that Christmas uh, was the conception of Jesus Christ. I think you'll enjoy this. You should have it. Don't let someone rob you. All right, bless your heart. Hey, we're back. There's your number, 1-800-643-4645 in this great state of Arkansas. Seven eight seven triple five six. You got a question or a comment? Get on the horn. Pass the note up to the pastor. Won't you do that? Okay, Sam from Pennsylvania. A prayer and a prayer for um, a fifteen-year-old on drugs, marijuana. Oh, my dear, dear one. God needs you. Marijuana sure messes your mind up, and God can straighten it out now if you'll accept Him. You know something? You don't need it. That manna that falls is far better, better, and it puts you on a lot better high. And we have such exciting things. How exciting it is to be a Christian, dear young one, with a clear mind that God can use. He'll help you. He'll release you from that desire. What's that? That was his prayer. You hang around. I think God has a purpose for you. Marilyn, uh, prayer for... Um, uh, Tricia, she has a she has a bad drug problem. All my young people, come on, and you older people, God has a purpose for you again. Tricia, I include you in there. You hang on.
God's going to release you from it. He can. Prayer request for healing for a friend of mine. Okay, a prayer for Sean uh, Dallas is in an accident. All right. Taylor from Tennessee. Thank God for Brother Murray and the independent teaching of God's Word. Okay, I don't believe that's a prayer. Okay, I believe that's all of them. Okay, God bless you. I want you to be strengthened. Know that miracles happen. But hey, to our Father, they're not miracles. It's simply His loving touch to you. You tell Him you love Him and believe in Him. Have faith to know that when He touches you, you're redeemed. He has the power. Heavenly Father, you hear the cries of the children. Look down. As credentials to your word and truth, the touch, heal, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. I'm proud of you. Father's proud of you. You be proud of yourself. Okay, uh, Ryan from Indiana. Are the elect judged at the end of the millennium? And if so, are they? what are they judged about? The elect are judged, and it is well written in Romans chapter 8, in the world that was, and they were justified with foreknowledge and overcame at Satan's first rebellion. That is why that God does not allow them free will. He will interfere in their life. That is why they are called election. Not that they're any better than anyone else. It's just that they weren't deceived in the first war. Clara from Alabama received the MB tape and the newsletter. Just loves the program and everybody there and will send donations today. Clara, God bless you. We love you too and it's good to have you with us. Carol from Tennessee. In Luke 11, Jesus said, You kill all the prophets from Abel to Zechariah. Does this mean that Abel was the first prophet and did he prophesy against Cain for God? In his deeds and actions, yes. Cain killed the first prophet. His children killed off all the other prophets since Jesus also fulfilled the role of a prophet. Uh, Jesus fulfilling the role of a prophet. We can determine that the Kenites killed Jesus also. You sure can. Those Kenites that called themselves of Judah gives our brother Judah a kind of a black eye. Our brother Judah doesn't recognize the Kenites either, but sometimes our brother Judah recognizes Kenites quicker than Christians do, and those of Judah that are Christians. Uh, Larry from from uh, Tennessee, I believe it is. Do you think you can make it to heaven without speaking in tongues? No, but it will have to be the tongue spoken on Pentecost Day which is absolutely not this junk that is passed out today. The tongue that was spoken on Pentecost Day was a tongue that, regardless of what ear heard it, it was in that language. It needed no interpreter. You couldn't fake that, friends. But a lot of people fake it today. The documentation is in Acts chapter 2. Any man that can show me that the tongue spoken in Acts chapter 2 needed an interpreter, I would change my opinion. I've read it in several languages. It was a clear tongue. That's why it was called cloven. It was in every language there is. You see, again, man can't fake that. Only the Holy Spirit can speak that where it makes sense, not babble. You see, you can make it to heaven without speaking that tongue but not as a first fruit. Do you hear me? You can make it to heaven without speaking in those cloven tongues, because that would mean you weren't one of the first fruits, meaning you weren't one of God's elect. I, I pray that you have ears to hear and understand what I'm saying. Again, you, I feel that you're challenging me a little bit there, Larry. Uh, perhaps not. But again, you document to me in Acts chapter 2. Now, don't go off where Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, about if you go to Mexico, learn to speak Spanish before you go, or they're not going to understand you. Get it back to the Greek and understand it says language, not tongue. All right? I'm talking about Acts chapter 2. It was not unknown. It was all languages at one time. My friend, only God can accomplish that. Nobody can take it. Okay, uh, Daniel, Mr. Murray, I'm writing to you again because 
even though I appear confident and strong on the outside, my soul inside is desperate and in need of help. I love for the intense I have I long for the intense desire to share with my fellow man. The spirit of slumber seems to be everywhere in this world today. Daniel, you hang in there and be patient. Your hour is coming. You're going to have that chance to speak, and your brethren will be anxious to hear what you say. One of the most difficult things for Christians is to be patient. I expect you to. Our Father expects you to. Your day is coming. When an opportunity prevails, plant a seed. But until then, be patient. Rita from Virginia. In Matthew twenty four fifteen, what does it mean, stand in the holy place? Okay, Rita, it means it was Jesus' word making the Old Testament, that is to say, the book of Daniel, a part of the New Testament. Because he said, on my return, when you see the desolator, that's the Antichrist, standing where he ought not, which means in God's seat. See, Satan doesn't belong in God's seat, and Satan is Antichrist then flee from Jerusalem, Judea, rather, as more correctly stated, because that's, why would Judea? Because that's where he's going to appear. If you want to know where he's going to appear, read that same verse, the 15th verse of 24 Matthew, and you understand. It is taken from, my dear, if you would, uh, the ninth chapter of Daniel, the 27th verse, where it speaks of the final week when the desolate tore. I know in English it says desolation. That's a condition. But Jesus said, desolator, that is an entity, that is Antichrist. That's why so many people are going to be deceived. They haven't really studied. Willie from Florida. Explain Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. How long is Satan's short season? I just love this teaching. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. The short season means uh, the short season he has before he goes into this captivity with five months. You'll read of it in Revelation chapter 9. You will find the documentation that he also was to have a short season in God's plan. Revelation chapter 12, following verse 7, after Satan and his angels are cast to this earth, those angels we were speaking of earlier, following the evil spirits of the day. That also was a five-month period, a little season. Um, first Timothy 6.16, some people I talk to say they have immortality. Also, please comment. Well, they say they do, and if they believe and understand, their soul does have immortality, but their flesh does not. For, as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse about 50, 49 or 50, it states flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to shuck it, friend, somewhere along the way. Carol from Tennessee. I believe that the souls that will be here during the tribulation of Antichrist are the one-third that were deceived by Satan in the world that was, other than the elect, the one-third also to be taught during the millennium, therefore deceived in the world that was, deceived during this tribulation, deceived at the end of the millennium. Conclusion, three strikes and you're out. Do you agree with this? I certainly do, I, uh, and, and, and uh, even teach along the same line. Carol, you're, you're, I hope we didn't lose some. That's a deep thought. Your documentation for the fact that a third of the people were deceived, the children in the world that was, is Revelation chapter 12, when the old dragon threw a third of the stars, which is God's children, with him. Okay, Josephine, why do some teachers teach that the Antichrist is a man and that Satan will be invited to join him? It's very simple, my dear. They don't understand the word of God. For he is a supernatural entity, a cherubim, and a man can never be called cherubim. It won't fit. It won't fly. Matthew Ezekiel 28, king of Tyre, which is Satan, with Satan cast to this earth. And then try to that's why most people will be, de be deceived as well. They're expecting a rapture. This supernatural entity is coming, teaching, saying he's come to lift everyone out, and they're going to run to him. Because they have been taught it's a mortal man, simply uh, Satan infested. That's why they will be deceived when this most beautiful of art, all archangels appears in the clouds coming from heaven, performing miracles that will deceive, if it were possible, even you that know he's coming first. 
Betty from Alabama, please comment. My aunt and uncle doesn't go to church regular and at a funeral was asked by a pastor, if you died today, would you have a place to go? Some pastors are ignorant. They think a funeral, that's the only time they can gather an audience is at a funeral. That's the only time they can get a new person to listen to them is when somebody dies. And it is poor, poor taste to try to convert someone at a funeral. Poor taste. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't certainly darken his church door, I assure you, because he's ignorant. Mary from Alabama. What color persuasion will the Antichrist be, and what color persuasion will Jesus be when he comes? And my dear, Jesus will be the same persuasion he was when he left. As it is written in Acts chapter 1, as you men of Galilee, as you see him go, so shall you see him return. Same. Antichrist is the spurious Jesus. In other words, he looks exactly like him. So they are the same persuasion. You understand what I'm saying? Doris? Doris from Indiana. Is Jesus coming in two advents? Yes, he is. He's already made one of them. He's only returning one more time. You see, Jesus himself only appears on the last day of this earth age, which is the first day of the millennium. The full Godhead does not de facto set tabernacle on earth until the end of the millennium. Jesus returns and never departs. Peel from Texas, Proverbs 30. The ants and the people do not uh, do not store, yet they are not strong or something, yet they prepare the meat in the summer. Psalms 30:27. It says that the locusts have no king. Then in Revelation 9:11, it says that the locust king is a pion. Why are these two verses contradicting themselves? They're not, beloved. Listen, the Proverbs take literal things and show you that they are very well organized without a king. But man's got to have a king, right? The locusts that are spoken of in this verse are the literal locusts. The locusts spoken of uh, in Revelation chapter 9 are not locusts. They're men, evil spirits that ride upon horses and have faces of men, wear breastplates. Read that chapter 9 again. It's only used symbolically in Revelation. Uh, Stan from Kansas, what can you say or do to prove that Isaiah 13 is not talking about the USA? Are there two Babylons, one that was being destroyed, one that has been destroyed because of idol worship, and by uh, and also another mystery Babylon of the book of Revelation destroyed by adulteries? That's true. Revelation, thir uh, Isaiah 13 speaks of Babylon. The U United States of America is not Babylon. It's the greatest Christian nation, though it splits. Incidentally, I just completed a study in a newsletter on New Babylon being rebuilt, rebuilt, where there will be an international music festival there this coming September. Don't let that draw any of you off. Babylon, the mystery harlot, sits in Judea, Jerusalem, when Antichrist sits there. Babylon in the Hebrew tongue means confusion. It is the confusion of a supernatural entity standing upon Mount Zion, claiming to be Jesus, that deceives the people, that will deceive them. Don't let anything draw you away from that, especially thinking that this great nation is Babylon, for it is not. Church from Mississippi. Acts chapter 2, where do the Holy, where, where the Holy Spirit comes on them? Please explain for my friends specifically what was said. What was said is recorded in the book of Joel. Peter stated after they had spoken, this is that, which is a Hebrew metaphor, meaning this is a sample of that that Joel stated would be done. The most important thing, as well as what was said, is the time to, when the locust army, the one we just spoke of from Revelation 9, comes upon us, then will God be let be delivered up and will speak in those many languages. But it will not be they that speak, but the Holy Spirit. Is it not written in Mark 13, 
When Jesus says, just before I return, you're going to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan to witness against Antichrist for my name's sake. You are not to premeditate what you will say beforehand. It will not be ye that speaks, but the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. That is a very specific time. It's when Antichrist is on the throne in Jerusalem. It will not happen until. Dave from uh, Florida. Will we be able to recognize our loved ones that died when we get to heaven after our death on earth? Absolutely. Ezekiel chapter 44 documents the fact that you will. George from Virginia. Psalm 78 verses 16 and 20. Is the rock mentioned here the same as Jacob's pillar? Bless your heart, George. I'm proud of you. It is. It certainly is. That's the rock that God smote and water poured forth. Though Moses smote it, God uh, created the action. Leonard from Mississippi. Recite scripture of destruction of earth before the time of Adam. Okay, uh, probably you heard me the evening before talking to a young person. That scripture that most describes the destruction was in Jeremiah chapter 4, where they were being bad, disobedient. And God said, hey, if you, if you think I won't destroy this earth again, you're kidding yourself. And then he reiterates how he accomplished it. As a matter of fact, God started with uh, verse 22, I think it was, where he said, My people are spottish. You know what that is? Stupid. My people are stupid. They just can't learn that I destroyed this earth before is what he's saying. Start with verse 23. That is not speaking of Noah's flood, for every last living being was destroyed. Okay, uh, Jane from, from Kentucky. Do you baptize in Jesus' name, or do you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? I baptize in the name of Yahweh, Yeshua, Kadesh, Rak. All right? The sacred name. When you say Jesus, you say both the Father and the Son. People show their ignorance when they're not aware of that. Yeshua is the Father's Savior, Father and Son. What did I say in Hebrew? Yahweh, his sacred name. Yeshua, his Savior. Kadesh the, the Holy, the Holy Spirit. The, he heard your comment on margarine. My reference would be First Chronicles uh, 11, 17, 26. Blood has unclean spirits. Good thought. I'm not going to uh, let me get away with not explaining further. I don't want to bring the subject up. Ola from South Carolina. Please comment on Genesis 10:10 10, 10 and Genesis 11:1. 1. It's strange that this scripture would come up when we've been talking about languages. Genesis 10:10. 10, 10, explains that Nimrod founded Babel. And your Genesis 11, 1, all people at that time were of one language. That's to say one tongue. That tongue that will be spoken just at Christ's return. That tongue then was scrambled by Almighty God and they all began to babble. Genesis nineteen thirty two. how could they have... I'm just... <laughs> Uh, Ola, I'm just going to say that they made him drunk. It's written. They made him drunk. The daughters. Okay. Barbara from Pennsylvania. Do you think Christ's own will have to go through the tribulation? We will be here, but we don't go through it. It's not a tribulation to us. All it is is Satan holding a big revival. And friends, we're not going except to talk against him. There's not going to be any killing or slaughter. It's Satan playing the role of Jesus. Save, save, peace, peace. Do you think the kingdom of God will be set on earth before the heaven and earth pass away? The millennium temple will be. For the earth is not changed until Revelation 21, which brings in the millennium, I'm sorry, the eternal earth. And it doesn't say destroyed. It says rejuvenated. That's what throws many people off. Okay, let me see if we have any prayers here. We do. John Ballard from South Carolina, please pray. Yeah, we have to give the uh, We have children on drugs. John, let's just say, Father, help them, cleanse them. Okay, Jim from Minnesota. This is the first one. I think you are doing a good job. We, you've opened my eyes and ears. The teaching just flows. 
In Psalms 22, did Christ say the whole psalm or just the first few verses? My favorite psalm is 1, 1, and 3. That's a dandy. Now, that's how I live my life. Great. In the Hebrew, the last verse in Psalms 22 is, It is done, which is the equivalent of, It is finished. His words on the cross. That's why I feel beyond any shadow of a doubt that he recited the entire psalm. Plus, I thirst, which is another psalm we covered earlier with more in-depth meaning. Okay, this is a rather long one. I hope I'm able to get it in. And from T-something, all right? Tennessee. Tennessee, do you think that the shroud of Karen is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ? If so, could the transformation which raised Jesus from physical death have caused the image on the shroud to become negative when it was photographed? It's very possible. No one's ever been able to disprove it, and, and um, it certainly isn't disallowed in the Scriptures in as much as God said we would have signs. Burton from Alabama. I made a vow to the Lord, and now I've run into a lot of opposition in church concerning vows. People say they aren't vows anymore. Please come and enjoy the program. Uh, if you promise God you're going to do something, then you should do it. If you're come, if you're mocking the vows of the Old Testament, that isn't what God necessarily wants us to do today. He has duties for us. Learn what they are. Learn it by learning His plan. Bless your hearts. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all so very much. I enjoy bringing you His Word. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. The most important thing we want from you is that you study God's Word. Stay in it every day, and it's a beautiful day. Jesus is the living Word.